It is good to be with everybody this morning. Like I said a while ago, there was a gentleman who, who could not see. He was walking down the sidewalk. He got thirsty, and he walked into this particular place that he knew about, and, and he walked up, and they had a place for him to sit down up at the bar, and he, he sat down, and, and uh, he ordered a, a Coke to drink, and, and uh, Coke got there and everything, and he, he knew that there was people sitting around him. He said, he said hey, y'all want to hear a, a joke? It's a blonde joke. Well, the lady who happened to pull up his coat was blonde. And she said, Mr., she says, I realize you can't see. She says, but there's all kinds of blonde people, especially blonde women sitting around you today. She said, she said, I work here. She said, there's a paramedic sitting on one side of you. There's a police officer sitting on the other side. There's a bodybuilder sitting out at a table out there. She said, are you sure you want to tell this joke? He said, no, I don't want to have to repeat it more than one time. <laughs> Whew. I'm in trouble now, aren't I? I'm in trouble now. Have you, uh, have you, uh, June? Yes, yeah, it sits up there. They're ready, to, they're, they're ready to go. They can cut, cut loose. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, this morning, I want to speak to us and talk to us about being an empowered missional disciple. An empowered missional disciple. Uh, one of the things that I think that so many times what happens is we hear this word disciple. We hear the words discipleship, and sometimes we're not always so familiar with, or, or sometimes what happens, we, we get so used to hearing these words, and they don't necessarily come to us, and they don't necessarily uh, explain to us what it is it, it's all about. And brothers and sisters, I, I want all of us to remember, all of us to understand this morning, is that every single one of us are called to be disciples. I think sometimes people get this in their mind. They look at it and they say, well, in the Bible there were the disciples. And, and they kind of put the disciple up here on a pedestal. And they kind of think, well, I'm, I'm not there. That's not me. That's not who I am. But, brothers and sisters, you are. Every single one of us are called to be a disciple. As a matter of fact, if you have been saved by Jesus Christ, if his blood has covered your sin and you have given your life and your heart to him, you are a disciple. Every single one of us. And so we need to remember and to understand that as disciples, every single one of us are to be missional in our discipleship. Uh, one of the things that I want to be able to try to help dispel for us, and maybe, maybe even, uh, it might even be kind of a paradigm shift for us to even kind of think of a different way, or think of it in a different way. Brothers and sisters, every single one of us are called to be disciples. And what we are supposed to do is not only are we supposed to go, we, we always hear and we put a lot of emphasis on go make disciples, right? We hear that all the time and then that sort of thing. And then sometimes people get, kind of ask the question, they kind of think, well, what about the people here? So, so in other words, what it says in their mind, it says, well, that means to go out, but what about here? Let me tell you that disciples are supposed to disciple each other. We're here for each other. Not just that we go out and make disciples, but we also disciple each other here. Iron sharpens iron. As we come together in fellowship, as we come together in prayers, we come together in song, as we come together and, and, and cry out to the Lord, those, those people, those different things that are in our heart and on our heart and maybe have been mentioned this morning, that is part of being a discipleship because what is happening is we are voicing those concerns that others may be a part of be a part of the discipleship. We're here to learn from each other. Brothers and sisters, we can and we should learn from each other every time we come together. Someone can say something, someone can do something that would help every single one of us be better, do better. That we might be able to, to hear one another. That we might be able to encourage one another. That we might be able to lift each other up. So when we talk about being a disciple, we go talk about going and making disciples. Yes, Jesus did give us a command. And that's exactly what it is. It is a command. We as a church family cannot ignore this. We cannot put it aside. We cannot say, well, we need to focus inward instead of focusing outward. Because you cannot do that and follow what Jesus has called us to do. 
As a matter of fact, when we focus inward, we focus inward so that we can go outward. Does that make sense? When we encourage each other, when we lift each other up, it, what it does is it, it allows us to be, to be lifted up, to be, uh, be, to be brought up, and then to be able to take that into the world with us as we go out. And that's what it is supposed to be. As we go out, yes, we are supposed to make disciples. In other words, we are supposed to be people who are excited about the gospel message of Jesus Christ. We're supposed to be excited about the fact that Jesus looked at me and thought me worthy enough to die for. And so when we look at that, we look at, the, that through, through, at people through the eyes of Jesus and we recognize and understand. He didn't just die for me, he also died for them and they need to know Jesus Christ too. So when we do that, when we look at that and we allow ourselves to be able to understand that what we do when we come together is we come together to disciple ourselves that we might go out and make disciples. Because you became a disciple when you asked Jesus Christ to be, come into your life and into your heart to forgive you of your sins. Jesus said this, very familiar, we've heard this, you heard it last week, we're going to hear it again. And Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go there, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. When Jesus gave this command, when he told the disciples, this is what you're supposed to do. This is what we are supposed to do. This is the foundation upon which the church is built. As a matter of fact, it is one of the very first commands that Jesus gives after his resurrection to the disciples that says, here is what you're supposed to do. You go and make disciples because I have discipled you. And as I have discipled you, you are to teach them in what I have taught you, that they might become disciples also. Brothers and sisters, that is the church. That is what we are here for. We are here for each other. We are here to be able to lift each other up. We are here to be able to, to, to slap each other on the back, shake a hand, hug each other's neck, uh, drink, drink some of the crazy water out in the fellowship hall, right? We're, we're here to be able to come and do those things. Eat a donut and get a sugar rush so you can go to sleep during the message, right? So, I mean, that's, all of those things come together and all those things work together. But also, what, what it, it is is that it is to build each other up. That's what it's all about. That's what this is about. So that we can learn more. And be encouraged. Earlier this week, I'm, I'm just going to tell you I'm not going to be ashamed. I come in here and I prayed over this sanctuary. I prayed for every single one of you that are sitting in here this morning. I prayed, I prayed out loud and I prayed that the blessing of the Holy Spirit would pour out on this place. Because brothers and sisters, when we have the blessing of the Holy Spirit, when the Holy Spirit becomes active and when he gets hold of us, there is nothing in this world that will stop us taking this message into the world around us. So when we, when we recognize and understand that we have the Holy Spirit to help us, he helps us to be empowered, missional disciples. Well, one of the things that happens whenever we talk about this, sometimes we say, okay, okay, it's good. You've told me that. You've said that. Over and over and over again, you've told me that. Well, we need to know what is a disciple? What is a disciple? And one of the questions that we need to ask while, while we're talking about looking at what is a disciple is... Are we doing what Jesus instructed us to do? Because, see, this, this is for all of us. This isn't just for one. It's not just for the pastor. Look around you real quick. See how many people are sitting in here? There's a few back in the back back there, too. There's a whole lot more of y'all than there is of me. Amen? Amen? And when we are empowered to be missional disciples, it means that you get to come alongside, not just not with the pastor, but with Jesus Christ, to help each other, 
to be there for each other. If you know someone that's in the hospital and they're sick, guess what you ought to do? You ought to go see them. Right? If, if you know somebody that's having a rough time and a hard time, and, and, and you know that you've got a good ear and you can, you can let them uh, speak out to you and talk to you, what should you do? You should go listen to them and let them, let them, let them vent. Let them do what needs to... Because if they do that, they're trusting you. Brothers and sisters, every single one of us are doing this. So are we doing what Jesus instructed us to do? But then let's, let's answer that question. What is a disciple? A disciple is a follower or a student of a teacher, leader, or philosopher. That's the definition of a disciple. A follower or a student of a teacher, leader, or philosopher. And for us as Christians... We are called to follow Jesus Christ and his teachings. And where we find his teachings is inside uh, the, the four Gospels. We see the letters that are written in red. And we, we see what Jesus taught and what he said to us. And as we look at disciples and we see what Jesus did, we are called to live a Jesus-shaped life. Every single one of us is called to live a Jesus-shaped life. Now, constantly, all of the time, I always hear people will say things like, I'm not Jesus. No, you're not. You or I will never be Jesus. But let me tell you what happened to us when Jesus forgave us of our sins. The Bible says he came to live inside of us. Amen? And when he, by him coming to live inside of us, it means that he brought himself to us. It means he brings his Holy Spirit with him to live in us. So when we look at this and we see that, we are called to live a Jesus-shaped life. That is, that what we are supposed to do is we are supposed to look up, we are supposed to look in, and we're supposed to look out. Look up, look in, look out. That's what Jesus did. If you follow his ministry, if you see what Jesus done, it is almost kind of a, a triangle shape, if you will. Up, in, out. Up, in, out. Jesus done this over and over and over again. Look at what it says in Luke chapter 6, starting at verse 12. It says, In these days he went out to a mountain to pray, and all night he continued to pray to God. He looked up. And when day came, he called his disciples and chose from them twelve whom he named apostles. Simon, whom he named Peter, and Andrew, his brother, James, and John, and Philip, and Bartholomew, and Matthew, and Thomas, and James, uh, the son of Alphaeus, and Simon, who was called the Zealot, and Judas, the son of James, and Judas, the Iscariot, who became a traitor. He looked in. He brought in around him those whom he knew he could bring about and those whom he knew he could trust, those whom he knew he could speak to, those whom he knew that he could teach. And then it says, after that, what he, what he done, it says, and he came down with them and stood on a level place with a crowd of his disciples and a great multitude of people from all Judea and Jerusalem and uh, the seacoast of Tyre and Sidon who came to hear him, and he healed them of their diseases, and those who were troubled with unclean spirits were cured. And all the crowd sought to touch him, for power came out from him, and he healed them all. He went out. Jesus looked up. Jesus looked in. Jesus looked out. Jesus prayed to God. Jesus shared his message with his disciples, with his, with his apostles, and then he went out into the people. The Bible says all those who had unclean spirits, all those who had diseases, were cleansed because they reached out and touched him. Ooh, what power. Brothers and sisters, sometimes we live beneath what God intended for us to live beneath. Jesus said, greater things you will do. Do you believe in the power of prayer? Do you believe in the fact that you can reach out and you can touch someone? 
Now look, listen to me. I'm not, I'm not getting weird on you here. But I am telling you that we are connected to a power source that seldom we draw from. We are connected to a power source of, that, will, that will put us in direct contact with God himself, the creator of this universe. And then we tell ourselves, well, I can or I shouldn't or it's not good or I, this shouldn't be something, you know, that was for then and not for now. You know, that's what Satan wants you to say to yourself. You know, that's what he wants you to believe. He wants you to believe that, well, that was for then and not for now. Brothers and sisters, I believe fully that just as sure as Jesus said to the apostles to go and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, he was not just saying it to those that were gathered around him. He looked down through the century. He looked at, what is today, July 21st. 2019, he looked at the corner of Pine and Seneca and saw a little church called uh, First Church of God, and he said, every single one of you are called to be disciples. You are called to go. You are called to have a Jesus-shaped life. Up, in, out. Up, in, out. Well, a disciple takes on the character of Jesus. When you learn from someone, you take on the character of Jesus. We're learning from him, we want to take on his character. Well, what does that mean? It means loving what Jesus loves for the same reason Jesus loves them. Jesus loves me, this I know. For the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong because they are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Amen? And when we read that, when we look at that, when we understand that Jesus loves me, guess who else he loves? Do you realize that every single person you come in contact with, when you look into their eyes, when you see them, Jesus died for them. Jesus died loves them. I don't care who they are. I don't care what they've done. Jesus loves them. And he died for them. Not just a handful, not just for a certain group, not just for a certain few. It says, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whosoever, that's inclusive, that whosoever would believe upon him should have life and would never perish. Brothers and sisters, when we do that, when we take on the character of, of, of Jesus, we are loving uh, the people for the same reason Jesus loved them. And the disciple also does this. He takes on the skills of Jesus. We're to learn the skills of Jesus. This is why we have the Bible. This is why we look at the Bible. This is why we read the Bible. Why we study the Bible. Doing what Jesus does for the same reason Jesus does them. Why did Jesus do what he did? No greater love hath a man then what he would do is he would lay down his life for his friend. What did Jesus do? He laid down his life for a world who was turning their back on him. He laid down his life for all of us. And when we take on the skills of Jesus, it means we do what Jesus does for the same reason that he does them. That's what discipleship is. Well, okay, that's what discipleship is, but then how do we make disciples? Well, how do, how do we go about making disciples? What do we do? First, we give information. 
Then we learn to imitate. And then we learn to innovate. Brothers and sisters, every single one of us are supposed to be in the book. And we're supposed to be in the book to a, and to a point and to a place to where when we come in contact with people, we can explain to them who Jesus is, what he done for me, and this is my life afterwards. That really and truly comes down to, to what it means to give your testimony. This is who I was before Jesus. This is what happened to me when I met Jesus. This is who I've been since I met Jesus. Amen? Amen. And when we, when we do that, when we look at that, what happens is we share that information, the information of the Bible. Discipleship includes the study of the Bible, looking into the Bible, learning what the Bible has to say, and allowing it to have an effect on my life, not just being able to repeat the words, do you realize you, can, you could memorize the entire Bible, put it to memory, call any scripture, any chapter, any verse, any time. But if it is not having an effect in your life, it means nothing. This word is meant to have an effect on our life. And it is meant to affect others. As Christians, you're supposed to be contagious. Anybody, when, when school, school's about to start, guess what's going to come when school starts? <laughs> right? Right, Carissa? I mean, it spreads like wildfire, right? Mary, them little ones, they get to sniffing like little noses and stuff, and you've got to wipe their snotty little noses and things. Next thing you know, you're not feeling well, right? That's what... Brothers and sisters, we need to be as contagious as the flu. We need to be as contagious as the cold. As Christians, we need people to be able to look around. They can't, they can't be around us. They can't get against us. They can't look at us. They can't talk to us. That they are not affected for Jesus Christ. That's who we're supposed to be. So we share the information. But brothers and sisters, when we look at each other and when, when we do things... What about the imitation? What, what does it mean when, when we, we look at someone and we, we... How many of us have seen someone that we have absolutely no doubt in our mind? There goes a Christian. And when we look at those people and we see them, do we not look inside of ourselves and say, you know what, I, I wish I could live like them. I wish I could have their faith. I, I wished I could, could, could be as versed in the Bible as they are. But then, too, when we share the information, when we look and we, we learn to imitate those who mean so much to us, we are set free to go out into the world and share the gospel as the Lord would have us to share the gospel. So many people think that there's just a certain way. Brothers and sisters, let me tell you. General conversation will, lead you, will le help lead people to Christ quicker than anything else will. When you just talk to someone, when you just smile with, at someone, when you, just, uh, when you allow yourself to be able to, to, to listen to them for a few minutes, you'll be surprised at what they just might share with you. I worked at a Sutherland's in Benton, Arkansas when I was an associate pastor at a little church called New Song. And, and, well, it was in Benton, Arkansas. They couldn't afford to pay me. So I had to have a job. And I worked at this Sutherland store 40 hours a week at least. And as I went around in that southern store and I would, as I would help people and I would, I would smile at people, I would be there to help people and I would talk to them. And did you know that it would not be long that some of them would be sharing their life story with me? Some of them would be sharing, well, I've had to go to the doctor or I had to do this or I had that or I've got a son or I've got a daughter or I've got... 
And as, as people would come in, as, you know, people kind of come back over and over and over again, and they get to know you, then they realize that you're a pastor, then they begin to really start to want to share some things with you and that sort of thing. As a matter of fact, I nearly got in trouble several times because I was, st- I was spending too much time with one customer. I prayed with people in the middle of that store. So when we open ourselves up, we can share the information, but then too, there's people that are watching. There was, there was young people who came who were not involved in church who watched and saw that, and I know they made fun of me because of a good, lot, a good number of them. Even at that particular time, I'm not, I wasn't near as old then as I am now. I'd hate to know I'd have to do some of what I did back then right now with the shape I'm in. They made fun of me. I was that old bald man. To them I looked old. I was 40 years old. I I looked old to them. When when you're 19, 20 years old, I guess that's old. But did you know that secretly, when they looked around and there wasn't anybody else there, they'd come and they would talk. And they would share things. Did you know how many of them had never gone to church? Never knew what it was to set foot in the church? Did you know a good many of them never heard about Daniel in the lion's den? Or Noah's ark? Brothers and sisters, when we think about what it means to be able to have the information and the imitation, it means something. Listen to what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, starting at verse 14. He says, I do not write these things to make you ashamed, but to admonish you as my beloved children. For though you have countless guides in Christ, you you do not have many fathers. For I became your father in Christ Jesus through the gospel. I urge you then, be imitators of me. That is why I sent you Timothy, my beloved and faithful child in the Lord, to remind you of my ways in Christ as I teach them everywhere in every church. An awful lot of times people look at those words and they think, well, Paul's bragging. Paul's not bragging. Paul recognizes and understands that there is a world out there that does not know Jesus. And he says, I have looked, I have studied, I have worked, I have prayed, I have a connection with Jesus. And as I have done these things, as these things are real and true for me, they can be real and true for you. Imitate me. That's a bold statement, brothers and sisters. How many of us would say, imitate me? How many of us would look around and say, if you want to live a Christian life, imitate me? But yet that should be the kind of Christian life we are living. Paul says that what he wanted people to do is he wanted people to be able to look and to be able to realize that there is such a thing as living for Jesus Christ. And you can live for Jesus. So let's ask some key reflection questions. Who am I imitating? When I look at myself, who am I imitating? How many of you know how many of you know who my favorite actor is? <laughs> John Wayne, right? Well, I tell you, little honey, right? 
We're going to add them off at the pass. That's pretty poor, isn't it? I watch him all the time. Who are you imitating? Jesus. That's who we're supposed to imitate. Amen? But who, who in your life, who in this world... Can you think of that you, when you look at it and you see them or someone that may not even be with us anymore, when you look at them and you see their life, can you see you imitating them? Because really and truly, what did the disciples do? What did the apostles do? Who did they imitate? Jesus. I've told you before, there are two pre preachers that really influenced my life. One is Billy Sanders. Billy, Brother Billy Sanders is still alive. Maybe I'll get to catch up with him uh, one of these days. I hope so. I hope I, I do before he passes away. He's, he's getting to be pretty elderly now. He's the pastor that I, I grew up under, and I'm telling you, if ever there was a, 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 a brimstone hellfire preaching pastor he was it because he had a bible and back in those days still had the old big pulpits and he'd take that bible that bible's about that thick and he'd take that bible man he would pow 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 you could not go to sleep in one of his messages because i think if he looked out there and saw you nodding off that's when he'd beat that bible on that pulpit and man, he'd run over here and he'd tell you about jesus and he did man he'd run back over here and he was just so excited tell people about who Jesus is and what he can do. I often wish that I had a little more of that in me sometimes. The other one was a name, man named Brother uh, Linville Arrington. Brother Linville lived to be 102 years old. He just passed away a couple of years ago. Brother, Brother Linville had energy too and he was one of those guys, man, he would, whoa! <laughs> He'd jump for Jesus. <laughs> he could get excited for Jesus. He loved music. And if somebody, man, if I had some Linville in me this morning, I'd have jumped because we had some good music this morning. Amen? Amen. A man who, I've shared this story before, but I'll, I'll, I'll tell you. A man who took a pastor at one time of a little church who wanted him to be their pastor. And he felt the call to be their pastor. But they were a poor church. Money was tight. It was hard. Didn't have a lot of money. And in those days, a lot of times, churches still had the parsonages and things like that. And they tried to... This little church didn't even have a parsonage. He felt the call of God on his life so strong for that little church family that all someone had was a chicken house. And they said, we will work and help make that chicken house into a home for you. They took out the nest boxes for the chickens. They sealed up the walls a little better with some timber that they could in the cracks and different things. And guess what they wallpapered the walls with? Newspapers. And he moved his family into a chicken house because he believed in the word of God so strongly. I want to be an imitator of someone like that. So who am I imitating? Who's imitating me? People are watching, brothers and sisters. They're watching. So am I living a, a life that is worth imitating? Am I living a life that is worth imitating? 
Brothers and sisters, it is so important for us to recognize what discipleship is about because without it, really and truly, we're not the church. I mean, that's just the hard, cold truth. If discipleship is not in us, then we're not being the church of God. We are called to be disciples. We disciple each other, and we go make disciples. Then guess what we do with them? We disciple them. And then we go make more disciples. And guess what happens then? Go make more disciples. Listen to this quote. Biblical discipleship is intrinsic, intrinsically relational because it is an invitation into a mentoring relationship. We mentor each other. Those of you who took the survey, there was a question on there, and it asked, would you like to have a mentor or would you like to be a mentor? Well, really and truly, brothers and sisters, all of us should be mentors, and someone should be mentoring us. That's biblical. Those who are older in the faith, those who have lived in the faith, those whom Christ has worked and lived in for so long should take those who have not been there that long and mentor them. That doesn't mean you set them down and try to teach them or anything. It just simply means being there for them, talking with them, being available. Answer questions. That's what mentoring is about. One more quote I want to share with you. If you make disciples, you'll always get the church. But if you make a church, you will rarely get disciples. There's a paradigm shift in thinking if you really want to look at that. Because for so long we've taken the church and we've built the church and we've done this and we've said this. Brothers and sisters, the church is not the church without people. The church is not the church unless people's lives are changing for Jesus Christ. That's discipleship. So if what we do is build a church... It's going to be very, very difficult and very hard to get uh, disciples out of that because we've just got a church. But when you build disciples, when people catch fire, when people realize and understand that you are empowered to be a disciple for Jesus Christ, that's when your church explodes. That's when the feeling inside of you becomes something much different than what it is. There's an excitement to be able to come, to be together, to, to, to want to be with each other. You can't, you can't know how excited I was this morning to, to be able to say, I can come and be with my church family today. Do you know how good it is to be with you today? I look forward to it. I look forward to seeing the faces. I look forward to the handshakes. I look forward to maybe meeting someone new that I haven't met before. Or getting to know someone just a little bit better. Isn't that wonderful? So when we get people who are willing to be disciples for Jesus, your church is going to be totally, totally different. That's what we need. You've often heard, and, and heard me say, and I'm sure others have heard it say, we don't need any more religious people. I don't, I, don't, we, we, I, I don't want another religious person to walk through that door. Don't need no religious people walking through that door. Because religious people kind of have an agenda. Religious people kind of have this idea. Religious people are going to look at you, and, and they're going to say, if you're, if, you're, if you're not just exactly like me, then... They're really and truly going to have a Pharisee attitude. And a good many of them are going to be Sadducees. Right? Get it? Sad, you see? What we need is spirit-filled, Jesus Christ 
followers, someone who has a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. That's who we need to be, and that's who we need to disciple. Is people who are looking for Jesus. People that we can introduce Jesus to. So how is my up, my in, and my out? Am I looking up? Am I looking in? Am I looking out? And then two, how's my information, my imitation, my innovation? A while ago, I told you there were two men that heavily influenced my life as, a, as, I, see, as I look and as a pastor. I'm going to tell you about two more men. While I like John Wayne... I love two men. One's name is Calvin. The other one's name is Floyd. Calvin was my grandfather, Abbott. <coughs> if I could have the wisdom of that man... I could have the strength of that man. If I could have the humility of Floyd and the ability to be able to stick with it through thick and thin no matter what. A man who can tinker on anything and fix it if he stays with it long enough. He doesn't, he doesn't get mad. He doesn't throw his tools. He doesn't, he's not like his son. <laughs> if he can't figure it out, he'll just keep working until he figures it out. A man who stayed with his wife... and loved her when she couldn't help herself and could no longer do for herself and could no longer shower for herself. And never ever left. Never ever seen him get so mad or frustrated that he didn't want to be there anymore. A man who taught me Jesus. When when nobody else was going to church with him. He was getting up and going to church. I want to imitate somebody like that. Up, in, out. Share information. Imitation. And innovation. <sighs> My dad would not be in front of you speaking today. If I called him up here, he would probably hold his head down. He probably wouldn't look up. He'd probably be very, very shy. But he fathered his son. Whose desire is to share Jesus Christ? And as Clint prayed that one more might come to know Jesus. Amen.
one more come to know Jesus. That's what this is about, brothers and sisters. Maybe this morning we find ourselves in a place where my up in and out hadn't been too great. Maybe I'm not sharing the information and I'm not imitating. Maybe I find myself kind of looking in the mirror and going, I don't know if I really want someone to imitate me, not where I find myself at right now. That can change. Just like that. It can change with the first step. It can change with the first breath. Jesus is calling softly and tenderly. Jesus is calling. The song says sinners. But what about maybe just us? What's here for right now? We can live life. We can get caught up in life. And we can just kind of go through the motions. We can be here at church because it's Sunday morning. That's what we do. It's supposed to mean so much more than that. So much more than this just Sunday morning. It's just what we do. True worship. Spirit and truth. Anyone this morning need to come to an altar of prayer? Yes. Right away, when you say something like that, we know the devil starts fighting and says, don't you dare get up. Don't do it, because every one of them will go, see there, there goes a sinner right there. That's not what it's about. You get up, and I might be admitting, well, my life hasn't been perfect. Everybody around here thinks I'm a really good Christian, but my life hasn't been perfect lately. So if I get up and I go there, the devil's sitting there going, hey, you know what? Don't you dare get up, because that's exactly what they're going to think. They're going to think, well, you, you know, you, all these years you're supposed to have been this, and you've been saying this, and you've been claiming this, and don't you dare get up. We sang a song a while ago said he's a chain breaker. He's a prison shaking God. And he can save you. He can bring you home. He can change your life. Anyone? Sing a verse, Sheila.
things that we often think about sometimes. Well, I've been down there way too many times. You can't come off this enough. Where in the world did we ever get it in our mind that there's a limit on how many times you come to the altar? Where in the world did we ever get it in our head and in our mind that there's just so many chances? You have a Savior who died for you and who loves you so much. What he wants is for our relationship to be brought into, into rightness with him. If there's anything at all, anything at all, bring it to the Lord today. Allow him to be able to speak and do something and work inside of your life. That yes, truly walk out of these doors different than we came in this morning. I know it's getting late. Hopefully the pot roast doesn't burn. Amen. Quickly, real quick, if you would, please everyone bow your head. Close your eyes, bow your head so no one's looking around and no one would be embarrassed. Pastor, today I, there's something in my life I just need to get right with the Lord. And I'm praying and asking that we can work this out, that we can get it right. If someone's praying that prayer today, would you just simply lift up a hand? Let me, let me pray with you. Yes, I see those hands. Thank you. Anyone else? Yes, I see those hands. Maybe someone today has said, Lord, I've just wandered a long ways off. I, I'm, I'm, I'm a lot further off than I should be. I, I need to be brought back. I need, to, I need to get back in the lane. I'm off-road right now. Anyone's life like that right now? Anyone saying that my, my life is, yes, amen, I see those hands. I see those hands, yes. Is there someone today who maybe thought they knew Jesus? Or maybe they realize, I don't know him at all. My relationship is not real. Is there anyone here today who says, today I want to start my life with a new, real, true relationship with Jesus Christ? Yes. Yes. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Let me pray with us. Dear Heavenly Father, today there have been those who have lifted up their hands and they have lifted up their hands for various reasons and you know exactly what is happening and taking place inside of their life. And we pray and ask that in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ who died and shed his blood for us, that you would touch their life, their body, their heart, their emotion. Allow them to know and to understand that you are here. And that you are at work in their life. And you're bringing them home. For those who say, I need, to, I need for the very first time to really have a real true relationship with Jesus. Lord, I pray and I ask that this morning that they would be able to know and to go away from here this morning that they have no misunderstanding that you are Lord and Savior of their life because they have asked you to forgive them of their sin, they have repented of their sin, and they have invited you to live inside of them. May they go away from here knowing that in their life, knowing that in their heart, knowing it in their mind, and knowing that they can walk outside of these doors different than when they came in this morning. And Lord, I pray for our church family. I pray that we walk out of here with our heads held high 
humbly. Because we know and we understand that we are your children and we are empowered to be missional in our discipleship. Guide us, Lord. Help us to help ourselves and to help others. Be all that we can be for you, Lord. We thank you for this day. We thank you for this time. I thank you for each and every one that is here. Go with us now as we go away from here today. Lord, bring us back together again tonight that we can once again worship together as a church family. And we pray this in the name that is above every name, Jesus Christ. Amen.